we have a we have a, a, a stellar lineup to speak with us today. And one of my pet peeves is when a introducer spends way too much time reading off all the thing, all the accomplishments uh, of of the speakers, and then you don't have as much time to listen to the speakers. So I'm not going to do that. Um, H.R. McMaster had a 30 plus year distinguished career in the military, was the um, national security advisor during part of the Trump administration, and now is a senior fellow both at Hoover and here at FSI and CSAC. Um, he is also a historian and writer of contemporary strategic analysis. He'll be speaking first, we'll be followed with Catherine Stoner, who's the um, Marshbacker Director of the uh, CDDRL, the Center for Development, Democracy, and the Rule of Law, our sister center downstairs. Um, Catherine is a political scientist. Her most recent book um, is Russia Resurrected, Its Power and Purpose in a New Global Order. And she proudly is a member of Putin's latest list of people who can no longer go to Russia. Uh, it's, a, it's one of those, like the the Nixon's enemies list. It's one of the lists that that that. that I'm, on, I'm on it too. I'm on it too. Okay, congratulations. Right. Don't want to be left out. Don't want to be left out. <laughs> and me too, Scott. I'm on it as well. Yeah, Steve, Steve's a, a, a long timer. Uh, we also then will have as a third speaker on Zoom um, Ambassador Steve Pfeiffer. Um, Steve had a long career in the Foreign Service posted in many different places dealing with arms control, uh, among many other subjects, and uh, was the ambassador to Ukraine. So uh, this is a, a moving target. I think what you would say a month ago is different from what you would say uh, last week. And each week we get new updates in our thinking because the situation in the ground is changing. So let's start with HR, go to Catherine, and then to Steve. So please welcome our guests. Thanks, Scott. It's great. It's great to be with our colleagues. Great to be with all of you. Now, I'll just, I thought I'd just start first by talking about really what is driving and constraining Vladimir Putin with the renewed invasion of Ukraine in 2014. And I think it's really important just to recognize like, that 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 Putin is obsessed. A lot of people want to say, "What well, do you think he's rational?" I think he's rational, but he's obsessed. He's obsessed with restoring Russia to national greatness. And he's driven really by a sense of honor, honor lost associated with the breakup of the Soviet Union. He really wants to restore the Russian Empire. And you can see this in, in, in the speeches that he's given going back to 2007 in Munich, uh, as well as the, you know, the, the 7,000 word essay he published under his name in August of last year, where he really began just to telegraph the renewed invasion of Ukraine. You know, there, there are some things in life that are black swans, you know, unanticipated events that have that have unforeseen consequences. Well, I mean, the renewed invasion of Ukraine was a pink flamingo, right? It was it was right there in front of all of us for, for everybody to see. And and uh, and so that begs the question that okay, why did he think he could get away with it? What did, was he trying to accomplish? And then and then why did he think he would get away with it? I think the main reason he thought he could get away with it is that we have been portraying we in the West, the United States in particular, have been portraying weakness, and weakness is provocative uh, to Vladimir Putin. I think whereas you can draw a direct line, you know, from the initial invasion of Ukraine in 2014, from the unenforced red line in Syria to that event, I think you can also draw a direct line from the disastrous surrender to a terrorist organization and disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan and the renewed invasion of, of Ukraine. And if you just want some more evidence of that, I mean, just look at the joint statement that Xi Jinping and, and Putin issued on the eve of the Beijing Olympics. I mean, the message was, hey, you're, you're over, West. You're over the United States. This is a new era of international relations. This is also, of course, the statement in which they profess, profess their undying love for one another, or I guess, like, you know, the, or at least a partnership with no limits, right? And, and, um, and so this was quite obvious this, that there was going to be an invasion, but, but I think we ought, to, we ought to understand as well why Russia has failed. I mean, I think it was, it was a failure from the very beginning. And, and honestly, I think anyone who had spent a lot of time at least you know, thinking about military campaigns, knew that just by looking at the map, right? When you look at the map, you have to look at the scale on the map. This is a mistake maybe that, that Napoleon made when he invaded, when he invaded Russia uh, or that Hitler made when he invaded Russia. I mean, the, the vast distance that, uh, that the, the Russian army intended to cover to really 
uh, effect a coup de main against uh, the two major cities, Kyiv and, and uh, Odessa, and then collapse uh, any kind of resistance in Ukraine uh, and, and subsume the entire country. It looks like from now, from this vantage point, it looks like, wow, that was kind of crazy. But he was basing this, this, uh, you know, this, this invasion on four major assumptions, all of which turned out to be false. Assumption number one, uh, was that was that Ukraine wasn't even a thing, right? There would be no national Ukrainian identity, and therefore no real will uh, to stand up uh, to, uh, to to the Russian invasion. Uh, I think part of that also was his assessment of of Vladimir uh, Zelensky. You know, remember who at the time had a twenty five percent approval rating, uh, and also from Putin's perspective, you know, the short the shirtless guy on horseback. He's looking at a comedian, an actor, you know, a ballroom dancer of all things. That thinks, man, I can. I could probably take him, you know, is what Putin's thinking. Uh, and, and of course, you know, Zelensky turned out to be an extraordinary war, war leader and, uh, and has galvanized the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian armed forces. Second, and related to that first assumption was that, hey, you know, the Ukrainian armed forces are just going to fold. I think maybe he had in mind the Ukrainian armed forces of 2014, but there have been really significant improvements in the nature of that force. Uh, improvements in terms of, you know, military capabilities, but really the qualitative aspects of combat effectiveness and combat readiness, which of course we know is immensely important. Uh, and and that, that's because that lends itself to cohesion, right? Because battles really are aimed at the disintegration of human groups. And what you need are teams that are confident in their leaders that are confident in one another and, and, um, and are bound together uh, by common purpose, mutual trust and respect and so forth. And so I think the qualitative advantages of the Ukrainian army uh, were, were un underappreciated by by Putin, and of course the third the third the third uh, uh, the third assumption was that the the Russian military uh, possessed sufficient prowess and capability and capacity to accomplish this, and and of course the Russian military was not immune to the corruption that runs through all Russian institutions. Uh, it is a Potemkin uh, military, at least from a conventional uh, perspective, conventional fighting capability. It's important to when you look at these qualitative dimensions of combat effectiveness, I mean, conscription is a year long. You know, by, the, by the time you train a soldier, that soldier's integrated into a unit, they're rotating out. You, you can't build cohesive, uh, well-trained teams. Uh, and, and also, you know, their, their junior officer leadership uh, was killed quite early, uh, most of them, uh, many of them killed quite early in this. And they don't have you know, what I often describe as the most beautiful word in, this, in the English language, they don't have sergeants, right? They don't have non-commissioned officers uh, who can lead small teams, squads, and crews uh, in a capable, effective way. They also demonstrated a, an extraordinary uh, degree uh, of tactical ineptitude, right? I mean, if, if you drive a tank down a road, you know, without reconnaissance in front of it, it's going to get blown up. And guess what happened? Then, and then if you drive the second tank down that same road, I mean, then that gets, I mean, it, it, it's extraordinary the, the, the degree to which the Russian army was unable to conduct what we call combined arms operations. And that's combining uh, skilled and trained infantry, you know, with mobile protected firepower or, or tanks and, and various fires, artillery, rocket, and, and, and aerial uh, delivered uh, fires capabilities. They couldn't do it. And then of course, you know, uh, the old saying that, you know, that amateurs talk tactics and, and real true military experts talk logistics. There were tremendous logistics failures and, and frailties uh, within, within the Russian system, which I think has a lot to do with the corruption. And when you look at their, when you look at their defense budget, right, you think, oh, wow, you know, 68 billion, that's pretty significant. But then you realize two thirds of that goes directly to, to defense manufacturing companies, right? And, and imagine the graft and so forth. So the Russian military has been dealing with table scraps, essentially, for maintenance and training and, and these elements of, again, of, of qualitative elements of, of combat effectiveness and combat, combat readiness. And then of course, the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, assumption was again, you know, the West is over, right? I mean, we wouldn't have the will, we wouldn't demonstrate the unity necessary to, to stand up to Russia. And this is where I've, it has been really surprising maybe to not, not just Putin, but to all, many of us, the degree to which uh, even, even uh, Germany under the SPD, for example, Europe more broadly uh, did rally with the Ukrainian people and, and, and demonstrated a great deal more resolve than Putin anticipated. So I think this, the, 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 in, the failure of those offensives were easy to predict. It wasn't clear, however, whether the, whether the Ukrainians could generate sufficient capacity and offensive capability to be able to conduct a, a significant counteroffensive. But when you think about it, right, 
how long that line is, what is it, 1,800 kilometers defensive line for the, for the Russians, and the amount of force they have there, you can't defend anywhere, everywhere. So what the Ukrainians did is they said, okay, let's not impale ourselves on, on Russian defensive strength, let's attack weakness. And what the military term for this is a turning movement. When you, when you, when you render defensive positions untenable because you're behind them, and you turn that your enemy out of those prepared positions. That was quite effective in the north, in the Kherson, uh, uh, the uh, Kharkiv counteroffensive. But of course, the terrain is much different in the south. And that's where you see a much more deliberate counteroffensive employing some of the newly acquired and integrated uh, precision fires capabilities against the defending enemies there, uh, and, then, and then making especially Russian forces that are concentrated on the right bank of the Dnieper River, uh, it put, put them in a very precarious position. And I think we're, it's quite likely that you could see massive surrenders here, I think in the next uh, uh, month or so uh, uh, for encircled uh, elements uh, in, in, the, uh, in the strategic location of, of Kursan in, in, the southern, in the Southern Front. But, but also quite significant about the military counteroffensive will be the ability to generate more offensive combat power. That includes protected mobility, that includes mobile protected firepower. And this would be uh, required, I think, uh, in an offensive that would aim to, to recapture all the territory that was taken since, since, uh, since February 24th, or maybe even the, the, uh, the territory that was occupied and even Crimea uh, be before that. So can the Ukrainians generate that, that amount of combat power? That remains to be seen. Uh, but, but what's significant is now the integration of long range precision fires capabilities, which have taken out Russia's depots, their logistics depots, their ammo depots. And that's the easiest form of logistics resupply, right? Because you have a depot right there and then trucks just do short hauls, you know, to, to, re, to resupply units. Once you destroy those depots, you have to throughput supplies all the way back from Russia uh, under, uh, on, on uh, lines of communication or supply that can be interdicted. And you just don't get the throughput. They don't have the rolling stock to do it. And this is why the Kerch Strait Bridge uh, the, uh, attack was, was quite significant as well in terms of constraining Russia's ability to, to see and push those supplies into Crimea and then use that as a, as a base to, to resupply their forces. So they're in a very difficult situation. The Russians are logistically. And so what do you do? Well, what they do is they continue to commit mass murder of innocent people and they try to, and they try to, to, to diminish Ukrainian will uh, through attacks uh, on energy infrastructure uh, and now water infrastructure we saw even in the last uh, 24 hours. So, so what, is, what does all this mean in terms of the future with the whole topic of this panel? Uh, and I, I really think that there are a few factors to watch. One is Western will. Will Western will hold up, right? Olaf Scholz is going to, to, to China you know, on, on, uh, on Friday. Um, you know, will the SPD, will the, will the stoplight government in Germany keep their backbone uh, and, and the European Union uh, broadly? I think the answer to that is yes, I think they will, because I think of the conscience of Europe really being Eastern Europe right now. We could talk, we could talk more about that. The second thing to watch is Ukrainian will. And you know, I'll tell you, you know, bombing people into submission, as we know, doesn't really work very well. I mean, I think of Conrad Crane's book, Bomb Cities and Civilians. I think what's happening is, is that this, this uh, indiscriminate bombing using now Iranian drones is actually strengthening the will of the, of the Ukrainian, Ukrainian people. Uh, and so I think, but that's a factor to watch, right? Will they be able to sustain their will? And then the third, uh, which I'll just introduce because, and then we have two real experts to talk about this, is what happens in Russia. Uh, I think, I think the like, most likely uh, way this war ends is maybe years from now, um, after, after some sort of fundamental political change in Russia. I think other, otherwise, this will be a conflict that will go on. Uh, and and uh, I think what we have to do, uh, just what, what the hell do we do about that? I think we have to pull out all the stops and give the Ukrainians all the support we can give them right now. Longer range fires capabilities, longer range surveillance capabilities, and all the air defense that can fit into that country, uh, including interme intermediate range air defense. Um, and then I think, it, I think that the Russian positions actually in Crimea even could become untenable if, they, if, if Ukraine had that range of capabilities. So I'll just stop there and turn it over to my colleagues who can, can talk, I think, with much higher level of expertise about the dynamics uh, within Russia associated with this failure, with Putin now, as our friend Vladimir uh, told us, uh, uh, Catherine, this week, he said, hey, he told, the, he told the Russian people, hey, I got this, you know, it's just a special military operation, don't worry about it. Now he's going to the Russian people to bail him out, right, uh, in, in terms of the, 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 the conscription of 300,000 and so forth. So uh, really look forward to hearing the rest of the discussion. Great. Let me turn it over to you, Catherine. 
Um, can you hear me? Am I on? Am I on? Yep. <laughs> now, can you hear me? Okay. All right. So thank you. And um, so um, I'm going to uh, try not to repeat some of what HR said, and, and I will quibble with you um, a little bit, but um, but for the most part, uh, uh, be in agreement, I guess. So my understanding was um, I would sink deeper into Russia and Steve will sink deeper into Ukraine. Um, and um, I, I uh, think the way we need to start about in thinking about how this will end is think a little bit more about how it started and, and HR introduced this a little bit. Um, look at how it's going um, and then perhaps where it's going um, in, in toward an end, um, if there is one. I, unfortunately, I'll get to the bottom line up front. I, I would agree that an end is not uh, not near, unfortunately. Um, but we can also discuss what winning is for each side and what that might look like. Um, so why did this invasion begin? Well, as HR mentioned, um, this is a re-invasion, as most of you will know, right? The invasion began initially in 2014 with the seizure of Crimea following the ouster of uh, the Ukrainian president, Viktor Yanukovych, who had legitimately won the election, but um, uh, he backed out of um, uh, a promise he had made uh, on European accession, and so um, the, um, there, there was uh, uh, public protest against that, and anyway, I won't go deeper into it. Um, the war was ongoing against separatists in Donetsk and Luhansk uh, oblasts, um, self-proclaimed now People's <laughs> Republics, supported by the Russian military, and in the, in the eight years between 2014 and 2022, about 14,000 Ukrainians dead. Failed Minsk um, process, both sides um, probably to blame to some degree on that. Um, but I want to move to the most recent phase and why February 24th, 2022. So um, this is my first quibble with HR, I guess, is that they had likely decided on the invasion months before um, February, maybe even July uh, of 2021, maybe even last spring when we initially started to see troop build up um, uh, and then um, stopping that, that build up. Um, but then obviously we saw it picking up in autumn of 2021 and um, the Biden administration was very public with, uh, with sharing that. Um, it could be that Putin was stewing alone um, during COVID um, and getting more and more agitated about what his legacy might be. Um, and um, uh, HR mentioned the July 2021 article that he wrote, he's become a bit of a historian, but Professor Putin wrote on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. And I'll just quote a little bit from that, um, where he says, they are one people, a single whole. And he claims the West has pursued a divide and rule strategy. And he goes back, Professor Putin, to quoting Oleg the Prophet in the tale of the bygone years of what's known as the Primary Chronicles, written sometime in the 12th century. Um, about things that happened 300 years earlier um, on ancient Rus and Kyiv. He says of Kyiv, let it be the mother of all Russian cities. So why Putin goes um, uh, historically to that point and not to um, you know, surrendering Ukraine and perhaps parts of Russia to Denmark and the Vikings earlier than that, only Putin knows, but that's where he decides to pick up the story. And he assumes that Russian speakers in Ukraine want to be ethnically Russian um, and are being kept from being part of a greater Russian today by ill-intended Western installed elites who want to use Ukraine to keep Russia down. And this is the dialogue that we can hear and watch regularly on Russian state television. Um, NATO expansion, he says, was a plot to destroy Russia. Um, and the real worry though, I think is a successful westward leaning Ukraine that Russians might point to themselves and wonder why not us. Um, and so this explains 2014 and uh, going into 2022, I think I would agree with HR. There's some degree of opportunity there looking at the approval ratings, which, which were about probably 29% not uh, of Zelensky who, who may have appeared as a bit of a lightweight, obviously embattled um, politically at the time. Um, and, um, and looking at the West and thinking, they're not going to do anything. Uh, uh, Merkel is out of power in uh, Germany. Um, there, um, there's uh, the opportunity for us to do this and we probably will get uh, away with it. 
Um, he's also, I think, evolved over time. So you pointed back to 2007 in the Munich speech. I would say there's been a change over time if you look even at, at the speech he just gave last week in the, at the Valdai conference, um, where he's really embarked on this nationhood, nation uh, building project. Um, and in his, in his mind, it is conservative, it is orthodox, it is illiberal. Uh, and he's, he told us about this about four or five years ago in an interview in the Financial Times. So his view is that he's saving Ukraine and Ukrainians uh, from the West, uh, which is uh, overly liberal, overly permissive in terms of gender. And he's actually gone ahead and said these things. Um, the problem, of course, is that Ukrainians don't want to be saved um, by Russians. Um, uh, but like it or not, he's intent on doing it. So his goal was to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine and allegedly protect the people of the freshly recognized independent republics of Donetsk and Luhansk, who he said were being subjected to genocide. Obviously, no evidence of that. Um, at the start of the conflict, um, they occupied about a third of the of the Donbass region, those two oblasts together. Um, they wanted all of it um, and probably still do and clearly intended to take Kyiv, topple the Zelensky government. He anticipated that uh, Zelensky would flee, install a puppet regime and basically get rid of Ukraine as an independent nation state. In his speech launching the invasion, February 24th, he said Ukraine was quote, a constant threat to Russia. So he paints this as a preventive war. We must do this, not initially because NATO is going to attack us, but because Ukraine evidently is going to attack them. He says, and I'm quoting him here, for our country, it is a matter of life and death, a matter of our historical future as a nation. It is not only a very real threat to our interests, but to the very existence of our state and its sovereignty. So here I think he's conflating this, the Russian state and its sovereignty with his own regime, because that's the only way in which Ukraine um, as a westward facing independent sovereign nation state was a threat um, to Russia. It's a threat to the regime uh, of Putin, but not to Russia itself. Um, he added on denazification, demilitarization, which clearly means elimination of the state. So what the goal is now is a little ambiguous. It's clearly somewhat scaled back and he's, he, he keeps on saying now, now hmm, maybe all we want is just the Donbass region. Um, um, they occupy now about 20% of Ukraine, um, but it's not clear uh, how much farther they'll go. So um, his perspective on how it's going. Um, well, it's not clear that Putin gets full information or what information he gets. And this is the problem of an autocrat, right? Who, um, and, and this has been a hardening autocracy uh, over the last, I would say 10 or so years that fell off a cliff really uh, February 24th. People are afraid to give him information that is just confirming um, uh, of uh, what he wants to hear. So obviously he knows that Russian, the Russian military failed to take Kyiv. We can talk about why that is, but I also wanna point out that the Russian military for the most part was reformed from 2014 to 2022 and is not primarily a conscript army anymore. It's actually for exactly the reason you said, you can't really train anybody on high-tech weapons in a year. So only about 100,000 soldiers and, and, uh, until uh, September, um, September 21st and its mobilization were actually conscripts. The people who are supposed to be mobilized, of course, uh, were supposed to have some kind of military training. Evidently, it was kind of indiscriminate and it's not clear that people had any kind of military training. But, but for the most part, the Russian military is a professional military, but obviously beset with the problems of corruption that HR pointed out, yes. And second, um, also uh, not, a, not fighting um, in the Russian way of war, which would have been initially shock and awe, which is the kind of thing they eventually did in, in um, uh, Chechnya, for example. Um, but they didn't do that initially in Kyiv. And so one speculation here is that the war is actually being run by the FSB and not by the, by the military, and the FSB doesn't fight wars. So they don't really know what they're doing. And now suddenly here's the Ministry of Defense holding the bag um, and going to be blamed. So I'll get back to that in a moment. Okay, so clearly Zelensky doesn't go. Clearly Ukrainians don't throw bouquets of flowers at Russian invading tanks as Putin had anticipated and his, his faulty intelligence had probably confirmed. Um, they are not being held ha hostage by uh, people they concern, uh, consider to be Nazi elites. Uh, 
Um, and the Ukrainian military ignored his encouragement that they lay down their weapons and welcome the Russian military. So surprised. He obviously knows that happened. happened. He knows of the reversal in Donbass um, because he embarked on a policy of partial mobilization on September 21st. He's evidently aware that Russia has suffered significant enough casualties to embark on this mobilization of about 300,000, um, which was he was loath to do for the first seven months uh, of the conflict. Um, he wanted to keep the war out of people's psyches. Now it's very firmly in their psyches and maintain the impression that it was far away, it would be over quickly, and they were doing God's work, basically. So public opinion polls until recently would indicate that that was more or less going okay. Um, and we see, though, in the last month, a relatively significant, although not huge dip in his um, public approval rating. Um, and again, it's, it went from 80, let's see, 83% to 79%. So there's probably some preference falsification in there. We don't exactly, we can talk about that later. But I think what is more interesting um, is, um, is another measure that the Levada Center publishes, which is um, people's um, mood, how they say they're feeling. Um, and this is where we've seen a lot of change, right? So you might understand in an autocracy like Putin, you, you don't necessarily want to say, I disapprove of Vladimir Putin to some random pollster who calls you or comes to your door, right? So we have ways of testing that, and I can talk about that more later. But if you're asked about what's your mood, do you feel like things are going great or okay, or do you, are you, you know, tense or anxious? So here we see a rather big change between August and October of, the, of, of this year with, let me get this right, um, those who are saying they are tense to irritable, tense and irritable and worried went from 30 to 47% between August and October. And those saying they are worried um, went from 47% or is now up to 47%, pardon me. 52% um, say things are great or okay, but that too has declined from 75%. 52%. So that's maybe where we're starting to see the effects of the mobilization in society. And we haven't even seen large numbers of those folks coming who are purportedly ill-equipped and undertrained coming back in body bags. And unfortunately, I, I think we will. Um, the economy is also starting to suffer. Um, it's uh, uh, relatively low unemployment numbers, maybe because people have been furloughed and technically aren't unemployed, for example. But um, are not actually working or being paid. We do see rising food prices. There's some contraction in the GDP, although perhaps not as big uh, as what was expected. Um, but again, that's probably underreported, but there's a clear, because of the sanctions, um, shortage of inputs for production and oil, uh, and, um, for production in particular. So the oil and gas revenues are still relatively high and obviously very important to the Russian economy. But we've seen some decline in prices here too, and certainly Russia's sales um, have worsened and should worsen as Europe gets other markets, uh, other suppliers, and India Ch and China don't step in fast enough to pick up the slack there. So Putin is on um, a timeline. Okay, so what's going to happen? And I'll finish with this, Scott. Okay, so I think um, internally in Russia, there are different scenarios about what, what will happen. Um, here's one. Putin is ousted by an elite coup. There's a, a second could be that there is a social revolution or third Putin dies. But would any of these necessarily end the war in the short time, term? So with respect to the coup, it depends on, on which elites we think could win a coup. And I will just say, I don't think any of them uh, could right now. So I would say that there are, there are Three groups. There are hardliners within uh, with, that have KGB backgrounds, and these would be people like um, Khrushchev, Narishkin, and um, Bortikov. These are um, heads of the uh, intelligence agencies and then head, the head of the Security Council. They're not terribly competent guys. Um, they're rabid, uh, they're more arguably more rabid than Putin himself about the war. And they don't care about wealth or holdings that they have outside um, Russia. They don't care if they never leave Russia again. They stay, share the same vision of Russia as uh, a nation state that should stretch through Belarus, Ukraine, and at least Moldova. 
And I think the only reason they would have acted against Putin is if he wasn't pursuing the conflict hard enough. And so now, as HR said, we see the intensification using things that the Ukrainians don't really have, not just the Iranian drones, um, which the Ukrainians have been good at shooting out of the sky, but, but um, cruise missiles launched from the Black Sea, that kind of thing. Um, so I think he's pacified this group and perhaps, you know, Kadyrov, the, the Chechen leader as well, by hitting Ukrainian infrastructure in the last few weeks in the wake of the Kerch Bridge bombing. So I think they were least likely to coup against him anyway. Um, and if they came to power even temporarily to answer the question we were posed, how will this end? Well, they wouldn't be the ones who would end it. So let's look at another possibility, still kind of hardliners, but a second group of hardliners, and that would be um, the Russian military. So here we're looking at maybe the Minister of Defense, Sergei Shoigu, who actually wears a ton of medals on his uniform, but has never himself served uh, in the Russian military. Um, didn't start Brezhnev either, right? Um, um, or uh, General Grasmov, the, 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 the general staff more generally. So the Russian military, as HR has said, has not looked good in this conflict. And we can talk about why that's so. They, they had the capability on paper. They didn't seem to be able to execute the logistics in, in practice. Their reputations are kind of ruined, right, by this. Um, so asking Russian friends who are now outside Russia, they don't see a coup led by these guys as particularly likely either. Um, since Garasimov and Shoigu are pretty, pretty solidly Putin's guys, Shoigu is the only one in Putin's on Putin's hockey team who is occasionally allowed to uh, score goals other than Putin himself. Um, and so I think a military attempt at an overthrow would, would um, have to come from lower down. But as HR has said, a lot of those guys are dead um, because they led the initial charge in um, and um, it didn't go very well. Um, so it seems unlikely given, given also the rate at which many of the, of the other generals are being fired currently. Russia also has, even in the imperial period, no real tradition of military coups. Um, I'm hesitant to say that in front of historians sitting in front of me, but, um, um, and certainly not in the Soviet period. So if these guys attempted a coup also, they probably wouldn't end the war, um, might even intensify it. Other scenario, rich guys stuck in Russia, um, who can't get to their property. Um, I think all reports and indications are they are too fearful um, to get involved and there's a clear collective action problem there. Um, so I don't think there's an elite overthrow on the, on the horizon that would end the war, perhaps might even intensify it. And so what does that leave us with? And here I'll end, Scott, Russian society. And, I, and as I said, I think we're starting to see small movement. Um, but if you look at things like mood as opposed to approval or trust, um, you see bigger, uh, bigger movement that, that may indicate the social uh, unhappiness. But here too, there is a collective action problem. In the year, especially the year leading up to this conflict, but the years before, Putin has really effectively demobilized any kind of opposition. And so this was a really incremental creeping kind uh, of autocratization that gained really rapid momentum over um, COVID and the arrest of Alexei um, Navalny. So if Russia can't win uh, in the next six to 10 months, um, because the coalition holds together as, as um, HR said, and that's really important, and keep supporting the Ukrainian military, then I think there is a possibility of some social protests, larger social protests. There actually are some that take place in the streets. There are, there are bombings of recruitment centers, that sort of thing, um, but we don't hear about them very much. And it's very hard to protest right now um, in Russia. So I would bet actually on younger Russians who are most affected by um, this conflict. They're the ones who may be forced to go and fight it. They're the ones who didn't grow up with uh, the Soviet Union or with a sense of Russian nationalism um, that Putin's generation has. Um, and I think the best thing we can do is continue to um, enforce the sanctions we already have in place, intensify um, those sanctions and keep on arming uh, and supporting the Ukrainians. And that's the fastest route to uh, pressure, social pressure to end the war. Great. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. Steve, can you hear us? Uh, yes, can you hear me? And we can see you too. Okay, great. Um, first of all, sorry I can't be there in person, but you probably uh, prefer me uh, being at home. Um, let me um, agree with HR and Catherine that it's very difficult to see this war ending anytime soon. 
Now, in the early days of the war, early March, uh, it looked to me like President Volodymyr Zelensky in Ukraine was truly pained by the fact that Ukrainians were getting killed each day. And I believe there was a serious readiness in Kyiv to try to negotiate an early halt. Uh, they said they would set aside their ambitions to seek NATO membership. And they made a very interesting proposal regarding Crimea. Uh, the Ukrainians said, we will not, we will pledge not to use military force to try to regain Crimea, and we will also agree that its status will be resolved permanently within 15 years. That might have been an opening, uh, but you don't see that readiness in Kyiv now, and I think it's understandable why. Uh, what the Ukrainians have seen, and this has been, I think, the biggest factor in the change, was the war crimes, the atrocities that were seen in places like Bucha, Irpin, Mariupol, and this sense in Kyiv now that Russia occupation, what it means is torture chambers, summary executions, deportations, filtration camps. And then you add to it more recently this wave of indiscriminate attacks against Ukrainian cities. And I believe this is really a fundamental miscalculation by the Russian military with regards to how to fight this war is this is not uh, eroding Ukrainian will. It's in fact having the exact opposite effect. It's hardening will. And it's brought Ukrainians to this war as existential. They understand what Russian occupation would mean. And they also know that uh, a Russian win means the end of their democracy and the end to the vision that I believe drives a lot of young Ukrainians, which is of becoming a normal European state. It's also engendered deep animosity, enmity in Ukrainians towards Russia and Russians that will take decades, if not generations, to overcome. And you see this strength and resolve in polls. There was a poll to two weeks ago, and this was in the aftermath of the early waves of Russian attacks against Ukrainian citizens, citizens follow, cities following uh, the uh, Kerch bridge bombing. 86% of those polled said that they wanted to continue armed resistance, even at the price of those Russian missile strikes on Ukrainian cities. And there were only 10% prepared for early negotiations. And uh, HR said that Russia has been surprised by the Ukrainian military's ability. I also believe that Kyiv, to some extent, was surprised by their ability to withstand the Russian invasion. Uh, indeed, I think it's better than pretty much anybody would have expected. So at this point, I, I believe one, Kyiv is not interested in negotiations. And even if Zelensky wanted to negotiate with public attitudes where they are, he has very limited room to maneuver. And you see from the Russian side, no real serious negotiating spaces. As Catherine said, the original Russian conditions were denazification, an interesting demand uh, for replacing a Ukrainian government headed by a Jewish president, demilitarization, neutrality, acceptance of Crimea as Russian, and recognition of the so-called People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk's independent states. And in Ukrainian eyes, that amounted virtually to total capitulation. But what's been really interesting in the last two months, while the Russians have been losing on the battlefield, the Kremlin has really escalated their demands. Ukraine would now be expected to agree to the annexation by Russia of Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizh, and Kherson. Even though the Russians don't control those four territories, can't define what they are, and they appear to lose more territory by the day as the fighting goes on. So at this point, from Kiev's perspective, there's really nothing in the Russian negotiating position that offers a reason to sit down. And I believe what they're hoping is that as their counter offenses continue, perhaps they'll be in a position to improve their bargaining position for some later negotiation. Uh, and how does this end? Uh, well, Scott earlier on said that this changes from month to month. Uh, say three months ago in July or August, I would describe three scenarios. Today I'll give you, well, I'll describe three, but one is not possible in my view. The first scenario, which I believe is no longer possible, would be that the Russians somehow regain their footing and they achieve a military victory along the lines of what I believe they were aiming for back on February 24, which included capture of Kyiv and occupation of the eastern one half to two thirds of the country. And based on what we've seen over the past seven months, the Russian military simply is not capable of that. So regardless how the war ends, I would say there's going to be a sovereign and independent Ukrainian state on the map of Europe, and it's going to be far larger than the rump state that Putin might have envisaged on February 24. The second scenario 
is that the Ukrainian military wins and that they succeed in driving the Russians out of Ukraine or at least push the Russians back to the February 23 line. And I think this is more possible now than I would have predicted, say, two months ago, but it still requires a lot. And there's a question, does the Ukrainian military have the wherewithal to do that? You know, I'd like to see the Ukrainians capable of that, but I'm not sure that's possible. In any case, it would take time. So the third scenario, which I believe is probably the most likely, is this does settle into a long war of attrition with neither side capable of making a decisive breakthrough. And that seems to be the assessment of the US Intelligence Committee going back to, uh, say, May. And then the question would become, does the conflict reach a point where at both sides mutually become exhausted by the war and there's a mutual readiness to seek a more serious negotiation. Now that would require a huge change in Russian negotiating demands. And of course, Vladimir Putin has just thus far showed no readiness to seek an off-ramp. And instead each point he's doubled down. But real negotiations would call for Russia to change its position. And if Russian forces still were on Ukrainian territory, I think they would call for some very difficult questions to be discussed in Kyiv. And that would be first and foremost, the issue of territorial concessions. That would be a hugely delicate issue politically for the Ukrainian government. And that's why I would argue that kind of decision can only be made in Ukraine. And likewise, I would oppose now pressing the Ukrainians to try to negotiate because I fear that the negotiation right now, given Russian demands, would really center on the question of how much territory Ukraine should cede to Russia. And I don't believe the West should be pushing the Ukrainians on that point. Uh, let me just talk a bit about U.S. policy. Uh, uh, nine days ago, Mike McFall uh, had a panel for um, uh, Alumni Weekend, and we were asked to grade U.S. policy, and I was asked to grade U.S. policy on Russia, Ukraine. And my grade was somewhere between a B plus and A minus. Now, first of all, I think the administration has done a superb job in managing the diplomacy going back to last November. And it was not just the meetings that were held by President Biden with his counterpart and Secretary Blinken. But what most people didn't see were dozens of phone calls, meetings, and Zoom sessions every day between Washington, NATO partners, EU partners, and others. And it was the kind of consultation. I, typically, when I was in the government, I saw two types of US consultations. One consultation was we had made up our minds, and we were consulting with you basically to persuade you of that position. But I think this was of a second type of consultation, really exchanging views and listening to uh, allies and partners. And it was also bolstered by, I would say, a remarkable uh, amount of intelligence sharing that we haven't really seen before in this kind of crisis. And what that did was it laid the basis for right after February 24, when the Russians invaded, you saw NATO reinforce its eastern flank very quickly, NATO states beginning a flow of weapons to Ukraine. And you saw the US and the European Union imposing some very tough sanctions that I surprised both the Kremlin and surprised some in the West, particularly the uh, freezing of Russian central bank assets and cutting high tech exports. Well, the administration did draw one bright red line, which was they were not going to provide American troops. I would say that's the correct red line. Right now, Russia can lose this war and it won't be existential for the Russian state. The Ukrainian military is not going to march on Kyiv. Now, it may be existential for Putin's political prospects, but that's another question. But I do believe that if the United States and NATO were to enter the war on Ukraine's side with their forces, that could fundamentally change how this war is viewed in Moscow. And they would begin to see it as existential as aimed not just at defending Ukraine, but perhaps destroying or uh, dismembering Russia. But where my critique of the U.S. government would be is that I think the arms flow should be larger and it should be faster. The slow pace was understandable in the early weeks because many did not think Ukraine's military would hold out for long. But it's now clear that if it has financing, arms, and ammunition, the Ukrainians can last for a long time. They have troops that are motivated, but they need the arms and they need the supplies from the West. And I believe the United States and Russia should continue that supply, and it's time to consider other things. If the Ukrainians could manage the logistics, should we think about giving the Ukrainian military things like leopard tanks and M1s? I would also argue that it's time to consider providing the Ukrainians 
the longer range version of the HIMAR rocket, the one that can go 200 miles range. We've seen that with the 50 mile version, the Ukrainians have done a very impressive job in disrupting Russian logistics with the destruction of Russian command posts and Russian arms depots. With a longer range missile, they could disrupt those logistics even further back throughout Donbass and throughout Crimea. And that would further complicate the Russian military's problem. And we could give those weapons to the Ukrainians with the proviso that's applied to the shorter range missile that they would not use them to strike Russia proper. Although if we did that, I would also drop a hint that if the Russians continued to escalate, continued to indiscriminate attacks, that proviso might be lifted. But it seems to me that the more arms that we can provide the Ukrainians, the more that they can make changes on the battlefield, that might lead to a change in the Russian position. So I think it is the should be the US and the Western goal to help the Ukrainians either drive the Russians out or at a minimum get to a negotiation that produces a settlement on terms that Kyiv can accept. And to my mind, the question now really is, do the sanctions and mobilization and casualties erode Russians' will to resist before economics problems and lack of arms erode Ukraine's ability to resist? And the United States and the West have a big say in that. You know, We can keep Ukraine in the fight. And here I would agree with HR, this is really a question of Western will. Great. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you for keeping within the time limits. I'm going to open this up uh, to people in the audience. I'll make a list. If you could raise your hand and identify yourself um, and say your, your, your affiliation. Uh, keep them up for a second. Um, I'm going to call on Eric Schlosser first in the back row. Eric, we're going to have to wait for the microphone. Why don't you start again? The microphone was not enough uh, for people, including Steve Piper, to, to, to hear. So. My name is Eric Schlosser, and I'm a writer, and I wrote a book called Command and Control about the management of the American nuclear arsenal. And I'm wondering how confident you feel right now about Russian nuclear command and control. It's uh, Halloween, and one of the scariest books I've ever read was Dmitry Adamski's book, Russian Nuclear Orthodoxy, about the very deliberate attempt to inculcate among Russia's nuclear forces this sort of, uh, you know, Manichaean worldview of evil versus good that we've heard Putin talking about a little bit and some of the language about Satanism. And, you know, I've read about how if Putin were to you decide to use a nuclear weapon, that uh, the military might refuse to do it. But if there is a great deal of this uh, fundamentalist religion now uh, among the nuclear forces, do you feel confident that uh, it is centralized and under control so there won't be any unauthorized use of nuclear weapons? <clears throat> I'll just say, I, I don't really know. I don't know. And, and uh, you know, I think there are a number of factors you have to take into consideration. What are the actual procedures? And then, and then of course, um, you know, what uh, would, you know, as, you, as you're suggesting, would military officers in the chain of command, uh, you know, fail to execute, you know, a, uh, an, an order to use them? You're right, though, to point out that, that, that it has been sort of normalized under this doctrine of, of escalation domination or escalate to de-escalate. And, and in Russian war games, uh, I think it was the Zapad exercise in 2007 was maybe the first time where a you know the tactical nuclear weapon was simulated used uh, in in a in a, in a, in a conflict uh, that over the Baltic states, uh, for example. And of course, escalate to de-escalate is really just a, a way to you know to use a nuclear weapon. In this case, it was used against a Polish target, I believe, uh, in the Zapad exercise. Um, and then, and then to sue for peace on Russia's terms to say, okay, hey, here are your choices, you know, Armageddon or sue for peace on our terms. And so, I, I do think there has been an effort to normalize it. And and I'll leave it to Catherine to talk maybe about how the Russian Orthodox Church has been mobilized uh, under Putin as well to provide some, you know, some of this this messianic uh, justification for brutality broadly, uh, but maybe even including nuclear weapons. <clears throat> 
Yeah, so I think I think we don't know uh, what in the in the Russian nuclear forces, and there are people in the room who know more about it than I do the, about Russian nuclear forces than I do. But we don't have like polling to know how relig you know how religious they are and how much they subscribe to this you know sort of messianism. So I wouldn't say that that we know that that has penetrated. Um, Yes, uh, the patriarch is, uh, Kirill is very keen on this war, um, which is strange, uh, but, um, but he is because again, it's, it's being described even on Russian television as kind of a holy war, a jihad against the West in a way. Um, so, so I think I would, I would say we don't know for certain, but um, uh, Putin is pretty thrilled with ta um, tactical nuclear weapons and has, has openly said that, you know, that that they would use, they could be used. Um, but then they've also openly said they'll never be used. They'd never do this unless, and this is what the doctrine says now, right? That there was an attack on the homeland. Well, how do you define the homeland? Is that these, these four districts that they say they, including plus Crimea that they now occupy and own? Um, okay, well then they're nuking the people who actually live there um, and it's going to be hard to govern after that, you would think, right? There's also the possibility that even if they use something small, the radiation could blow into the agricultural regions of Russia. So these are other issues as opposed to just, you know, the guys in the, in, in the strategic or tactical forces actually pressing the button. So I would say, and I'm judging this in part from listening to our colleague Rose Guttemuller, who's unfortunately not here today, that I think it's gone from very, very, very low probability to now just kind of low probability, but but still pretty low. I think yeah, it's going to escalate to de-escalate, as uh, which is what they've tried to do for a while. Steve, yeah, uh, yeah. Again, I, I think at the end of the day, we don't know with confidence, but but I think there have been a couple of suggestions that in the Russian system, the Minister of Defense and the uh, Chief of the General Staff may play a bigger role in a decision making than say in the US system. And, and one would hope that Shoigu and Grossma, first of all, may not be quite as obsessed with Ukraine as Putin is. I believe that that obsession on Putin's part perhaps uh, clouds some of his ability to make uh, cost benefits analyses. And one would also hope that uh, particularly Grossma would have a clear under understanding of the risks of crossing the nuclear threshold. Uh, I thought it was a good sign that uh, Secretary Austin uh, spoke to uh, Minister Shoigu and General Milley uh, spoke to uh, General Grasimov about nine days ago. And hopefully I thought they were conveying some of that, just reminding them that, you know, if a nuclear weapon is used, a line's been crossed. And uh, at that point, some of the consequences may well become unpredictable, including for Russia. I just want to add one thing that happened this weekend, which was interesting although ambiguous, was in the interviews after his long speech, um, Putin was asked how frightening was it, uh, or was, uh, was mentioned how frightening it was when he had said earlier um, that if um, there was a nuclear war, Russians would go to heaven while uh, the aggressors would simply die. And he paused, Putin paused, just waited and waited. And what's ambiguous, he, he then said, I did that to scare you. <laughs> Whether it was the silence or the earlier quote or both, I don't know. And then he paused a second and he said, and it worked. Yeah, he's a street bully, thug, and a coward all wrapped into one. You know, And so that kind of talk should surprise us at this point. He's also backed into a corner, right? This is a crisis of his his own making. He he created this, so for him it is existential. So you can you can see where he might say, "Let's try it, let's do it," but it's hard to see what the battlefield gains would be. I just read HR on that using one. No, I, I don't think it's usable from a military perspective. It doesn't get any military gains at all for a tactical nuclear weapon. You have to use multiple of them, and even then, and, and the point that you, you already made, Captain, is the winds do tend to blow east. That's where the agricultural regions are. They remember the Chernobyl incident and, and how that affected uh, Russians. Um, and um, yeah, and then, and then how does that work into the narrative, you know, that he's there to, you know, to save the Ukrainian people when he's incinerating them, you know? So I, I just think, I don't think it's usable. Yeah. And I think Putin has to know that, hey, you, you become North Korea on the Volga after that happens. <laughs>
and, uh, and in terms of international isolation. Uh, and then I think the, the conventional military response could be quite devastating to Russia. I mean, I, I think an option I would develop for the president would be to strike every Russian military asset outside the borders of the country uh, near simultaneously. Everything. Um, Syria. Eastern I have Norman Neymark next. Uh, my name is Norman Neymark. I'm in the history department, also associated here at CSAC and at Hoover. And uh, <clears throat> we have a kind of a unique panel maybe to, to deal with this question. And it, it came from Steve's suggestion that maybe we increase what we give uh, the Ukrainians in terms of military weapons. And um, I'm just curious about air power. I mean, one of the things that has struck me about the war is, is how little air power has really determined the way the war has gone and what the Russians have done, first of all, in Ukraine. And secondly, this question of perhaps that came up earlier of trying to give the Ukrainians some ability to strike uh, from the air um, uh, against the Russians, which might be the only way really to dislodge them or at least to, to you know, some kind of combined uh, arms warfare there. So I'd like your reflections on the kind of dynamics, as it were, of air power. And let me just, uh, just a footnote to that. Are the Russians being restrained about using air power in Ukraine or they just don't see that it can, you know, there's enough, there's enough stuff from the ground that can take them down that they don't see the advantages of it? Okay, I'll just say that the, uh, the air defense uh, up from the Ukrainians have like punched way above their weight based on what they had initially. And you know, the, of course, the Stinger uh, weapon systems that were provided are short range, uh, the Ukrainians uh, destroyed scores of helicopters. I mean, so the, the helicopter threat, you know, because you would want to employ attack helicopters as part of a combined arms offensive operation. Uh, and, and the Russians have demonstrated a very low skill level uh, in terms of being able to operate those helicopters and what you call mutual support with ground forces. So essentially what you want to do with combined arms is present the enemy with multiple dilemmas. So as they're dealing with mobile protected firepower, infantry are gaining a foothold in the town, and attack helicopters, maybe operating from behind the forward line of troops, or engaging targets even further in depth, for example. And then your fixed wing aircraft are going further in depth, suppressing enemy air defense with, with your, your missile systems uh, to create maneuver ability and freedom of action for your, for your air forces. All of this it, it really demands a high degree of synchronization and, and, uh, and an identification of the simultaneous and then sequential actions that have to be taken to seize and retain the initiative over a defending enemy. The Russians can't do it. They just can't put it together. And when you can't put it together, you have single arms operating unsupported. I mentioned the, uh, you know, I mentioned the example of tanks driving down the road, you know, um, uh, which again, I, I, I love that too, because they waited for the attack after the thaw, I think, so that, you know, Putin did a, did a solid for Xi Jinping, you know, and waited till after the, uh, waited till after the Olympics uh, and they didn't have good maneuver uh, ability. But tiered and layered air defense is extraordinarily effective against uh, against all but sixth generation fighter aircraft, which have the stealth capabilities, which the Russians don't. And um, and this is why I think providing uh, the the Ukrainians now with intermediate range defense, similar to the Patriot system, but uh, there are many other European variants, uh, could be extremely effective. The other aspect of this that that has not gotten much attention in terms of the air campaign is the fight for the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. And, and the counter radar uh, capability uh, uh, fight that has been going on. Uh, US harm missiles or anti-radiation missiles have played a really big uh, role in this. And so uh, the Ukrainians have, have achieved a significant degree of freedom of action with the limited aircraft they have because they've been able to suppress uh, the acquisition capabilities of, of the Russians. Uh, and, then, and then also uh, the, the ability to strike uh, the Russian systems and reduce those systems that are important to suppress Ukrainian air defense capabilities. So I think that, you know, I think what you see is, is just tremendous losses on the Russian side. Um, I, you know, I don't think that they're willing to continue to lose more fixed wing aircraft. They're probably holding them back more. Uh, and you're seeing areas where in a local level, the Ukrainians can achieve uh, air, air, uh, air superiority for periods of time, which is quite surprising, you know, but they're able to put, put the elements together much better than the Russians are. Yeah, I think we should do it. I, I mean, I, I, so the question is, what, what about supplying uh, the Ukrainians? We could, we could, you know, we could provide the, the Ukrainians with MiGs that they're already trained on. 
And then also uh, if it, to train a MIG pilot on an F-16 is not that hard. So, I mean, that, that could probably, you know, that'd be like a three week course to do that. And, uh, and then F-16s would be a, a significant game changer in terms of, uh, you know, the effective uh, precision strike capabilities. But so with just long range precision strike, I would just go back to, to what Steven said, which is, hey, give them eight TACMs, you know, and, and those eight TACMs, I think combined with MQ-9s, which are, uh, which are long range surveillance drones that can operate above Ukrainian controlled airspace and see deep into the Black Sea. I mean, you create all kinds of problems for the Russians with those two systems, uh, as, as well as the, uh, as the integrated air defense. So I, I think, you know, these are, people say, well, that's too offensive. These are defensive weapons, right? When the Russians are using the supply depots you would strike in Crimea to, to, you know, for the munitions that are murdering people in residential areas, I think that's a defensive weapon. And we ought to provide all, those three capabilities to them with a, a big sense of urgency, I think. We have a follow on from a number of people online. We're asking variants of the, of the same question, which is mm -hmm. what options will the Biden administration continue to have to support Ukraine if the Republican Party takes control of the Congress following the midterms? Well, I'll, I'll just comment quickly. I'm not a domestic politics person. I'm not a partisan political person. But there, there is, of course, the, you, know, you saw the letter by the 20 progressives that went to President Biden. So you have the far left of the, the Democratic Party that, who's, who is wavering in terms of support they for the Ukrainians. It. it was a mistake. Yeah, that's, oh, that's right. But then you had the McCarthy, you know, the McCarthy statement about not having a blank check. So there are constituencies within both parties to which politicians are pandering, uh, which have doubts about sustaining the effort. And there is sort of a neo-isolationist, nativist wing of the Republican Party that I believe is still in, in, very much in the minority. Uh, so I don't think, I don't see Congress wavering on this. In fact, I think Congress uh, will probably demand even more support, I, I would think. Uh, but I, I haven't done a study of the candidates and if, you know, how many of them fall into that kind of, um, you know, neo-isolationist, hyper-libertarian, you know, uh, nativist, whatever, how you ever want to describe that wing of the, of the Republican Party. Yeah, Scott, I might add that support for Ukraine has been a bipartisan issue going back to the early 1990s. But having said that, I, I, I was made a bit nervous by uh, both uh, uh, GOP leader McCarthy's comments and then by the letter from the uh, 30 progressive Dems. Uh, I think HR is right. There's a little bit of a uh, uh, rattling going on in, in both parties that hopefully will remain a minority view, uh, but it, uh, and this is what Rush is hoping for, by the way. Right. And I'm sure, you know, the bot and troll traffic is going to be very intense, uh, on this. Uh, and, and Catherine, I know you were mentioning about Russian media. Do you want to, what do you want to mention? Something yeah. Like yeah. I mean, it, on Russian, uh, television, they're, uh, saying openly got shows like, uh, that led by Vladimir Solovyov, uh, that they're they're looking forward to um, the midterms and, and Republicans taking uh, the House and the Senate, and that will definitely, they think, uh, cause a decline in. I support. spotted Herb Lynn, who's in the back there. Who could help tell us more about that if one, we have time? <laughs> one thing I would add, though, is I think that the 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 Russian atrocities and and um, the way that Ukraine has used the media. Um, and Zelensky, who happens to be the man of the moment, right? Uh, who knows what kind of president he, he may have been had things continued the way they were. Um, but he's, he's actually quite good uh, on television and social media in a way that Putin is not, right? And so um, I also think, you know, the, these horrible, horrible um, violations of, of human rights and torture and, and murder, I mean, American people are not heartless, right? And when they see this, and, and this is, this is in Europe. These are people who, you know, look like the white majority here in the United States. That that even you know uh, the far right will will find this problematic. And I, I just say there's not just advertisements or social media in Russia. I don't know how many people here watched the World Series on Fox News the other day, but there were anti-Ukrainian support advertisements on Fox News during the World Series. Lots of Americans were getting that kind of message too. Anna GB, right here. Anna, Anna, all right. Hi, I'm Anna Gzmabuse. I'm a professor in the political science department. Um, and my question is sort of built on that. What do you see as the weaknesses of the various alliances, right? Along with, you know, the supporter, the international support for Ukraine, where are the weak points? Um, what do you see as a potential way of breaking this sort of current solidarity with Ukraine? 
Well, I mean, there were obvious ones, right? And you, I mean, I'd love for you to comment on that actually. <laughs> but you know, Hungary obviously is a weak point within the EU. I mean, so are others, uh, other countries who have, who are, the, are much more you know, dependent on, on, uh, you know, on Russian hydrocarbons, you know, for example. Uh, you have obviously the case of, of, of us, of Serbia uh, and, and, you know, Serbska and, and, uh, and but, but I do think, I think it's going to hold together. I mean, Germany, you would think would be the weak one, especially with the SPD. Uh, in you know uh, Olaf Scholz being from the SPD, uh, but you know I do think they've got to really step up the, their support. Now much of the support from Europe is hard to determine because they're not being very public about it. But uh, but I but I you know I do think that you know for example Estonia has provided more support than the Germans have. You know for example military support, uh, and and uh, and and I think it's it's time to really kind of for Europe to step it up even even more. Um, Steve may be able to comment on this, but I would just say also you know Russia has. Uh, and you mentioned my book but when I in the course of writing that but Russia has has very carefully seeded um, elements of uh, far-right populism as you well know right and so where and where it has been indigenous they have encouraged it by using money and whatnot over the last 10 or 15 years and so you so you see some of this in arguably in Hungary arguably um, How about Turkey that's a weak point yeah, yeah. potentially although Turkey's playing both sides um, and um, Italy um, Berlusconi, you know, coming out, and he's a very close friend of Putin's. Um, they use the same Botox uh, specialist, allegedly. <laughs> That's seriously like true, actually. Um, they're they're very good friends, and um, and you know, he he was needed to hold this new coalition together in, in Italy. So there, you know, the, the the problem is potentially, as you know better probably than anyone in the room, um, the EU. Um, I would say that actually they've been relatively public in trying to put the, this a, a cap on prices. Let's see whether that goes anywhere and actually works on oil prices. Um, but I think, again, this is something Putin wildly underestimated. He did not expect the, this degree of cohesion, especially coming out of Germany. And I would also just say Germany has money. They, they don't really have much to offer in terms of military support. Anyway, well, they've got a lot of tanks that they're not using anymore yeah, yeah. after they unilaterally disarmed. Right, but are they even <laughs> operational? Oh yeah, they're still they're still in good shape. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think we can have a lot more confidence in Europe holding than say was the case four months ago. I, I was in Germany for five days about three weeks ago, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I would the, the Germans seem to think that they're going to make it through this winter without much difficulty. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they're going to have to make some adjustments. So large industrial firms that use lots of gas may be having a three week vacation around Christmas and such. But the sorts of concerns that I think people were feeling about the impact of the Russian energy cutoff, yeah. they seem to think they can manage. So yeah. that gets us to that we get to the spring, then things become a bit easier. I'll so just quickly, I think the, for hope. And, and I think East, Eastern Europe and the Nordic states, for example, I mean, that's they're, they're really become, been strong and have been an important counterbalance to anyone who would try to rate, you know, draw into question the support for Ukraine. They're highly yeah. motivated. Yes. <laughs> Arzan Becker. Thanks, Scott. Uh, I'm Arzan Tarapur. I work on South Asia upstairs in APAC. Uh, it seems to me that the Ukraine war is a great laboratory or test case for what academics debate about between what we call the deterrence model of war and the spiral model, right? Do you fight hard and, in this case, support? your ally as hard as you can and does that strength deter the adversary or does it create a spiral that accelerates war and accelerates escalation now i don't want your answer for this but we've spoken a lot about the various menu of options we've got to calibrate and to escalate right from f-16s attack nato troops is a red line going into russia may or may not be so not what is the substantive right sweet spot for this but how do decision makers here in the west in in washington and in kiev figure out what is the right what is the right sweet spot between deterring and between spiraling right is it a matter of as ambassador pfeiffer said at the start setting a clear a priori red line and not violating that or is it a matter of constantly reevaluating the situation which is both good because it updates your information, but bad because you could get dragged in inadvertently. Thank you. I would just say, you know, I think you ought to do what it takes to win. I know that sounds weird these days. Uh, when, when, you, when you talk about, uh, 
you know, you know, responsible ends to wars, which I don't know what the hell that means. I mean, I never got in a boxing ring and said, I just want to bring this match to a responsible end. You know, I mean, and the stakes are, are much higher uh, in war than they are in a boxing match. So I think it's, it's you know, if, it's whatever it takes for the Ukrainians to win. And I think, you know, the Prussian philosopher of war, Karl von Clausewitz, had it right that winning in war means convincing your enemy that your enemy has been defeated. And, um, and, and so there is no little, you know, perfect balance thing to be struck. Uh, I think if you go to Yale Law School, you might think about war that way. Uh, but but I, I don't think that's a serious way to think about war, you know, and and uh, and I think we've had too much of it uh, in places like Afghanistan and, and Iraq over the years where we had too many, no offense to any Yale Law School grads uh, who think that they're strategists, uh, you know, uh, putting troop caps on, you know, and 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 uh, managing wars uh, the way Robert McNamara did in Vietnam. How did that work out? You know, so I, I just think um, I think we we ought to recognize that you want to give in war uh, overmatch to the side that you're supporting and you want to have overmatch. There's no such thing as just barely winning in war. Uh, I mean, I think barely winning war is an ugly proposition actually. Uh, so we ought to not be metering out. You know, you can have this weapon, but not that weapon system. You can have this many, but not that many. I think it ought to be whatever it takes to achieve overmatch over the Russian forces and to really impose Ukraine's will on the Russians by recapturing that territory. So um, that's the way I think about it, but I know that's at Stanford University, it probably sounds a little bit odd. I, I, just, <laughs> I, I have to run my class at 115. So the one, one thing I would say is um, it's great that you picked on Yale Law School and not Stanford Law School. <laughs> that's that very popular. And, um, and, and second, um, I, I think, you know, just Sort of taking that to the ground level, what would it take for Russia under Putin to be convinced that they had lost? That's a huge question, right? Um, and so to, to the point where they would they would stop. And so the fear for the Ukrainians, quite reasonably, is they'll just do what they did in 2008, and they will stop, and then they will, uh, or pardon me, 2014, and then they will rearm, and they'll come back in eight years later. Um, so that. That's the concern, right? Is you really would have to be convinced that uh, you have defeated them enough that they will not come back in the in the near term, and that Ukrainian sovereignty is established, and that is requires a huge overmatch. It seems to me. Yeah, I just make a quick point. In war, each side tries to outdo the other, right? And so if you if you just go, oh, maybe I'll just go escalate a little bit more. Of course, the future course of events doesn't depend on your little escalation. It depends on enemy responses and initiatives that, that, that you can't really predict with a high degree of certainty. But I want, I'd love Steve to come. Okay, last word, Steve. Yeah, I, I would just comment that uh, I think it's gonna be very difficult for the Ukrainians to defeat the Russians so badly that the Russians could never regroup and try it again five or six years down the road. I mean, guys, I think the Ukrainian military really does stop at the Ukrainian border. And that really though becomes the question though for what happens after the war. And that's where I think that uh, you know the Ukrainians are talking about what kind of security guarantees they might have. Um, I think it's going to be very hard uh, for them to see a prospect of getting into NATO anytime soon because it's pretty clear NATO countries or many NATO countries at this point are not prepared to commit their forces to fight Russia on Ukraine's behalf. What Ukraine should instead be seeking is telling the West, okay, we want you to build us a modern military, M1 tanks, Leopard tanks, F-16s, so that we have a military so powerful that the Russians would never consider trying this again. And my guess is that Western leaders in Washington, Berlin, London, elsewhere would be far more prepared to provide that kind of answer to the Ukrainians than uh, it would be that you'd find a consensus among 30, 30, soon to be 32 NATO members on giving Ukraine a security guarantee. With Deep apologies to the many people in the room who didn't get to ask the question and even more people online. Um, I just note that uh, it is the time that we have to leave and Catherine especially has to run off for class. Please grab uh, a lunch box uh, and go outside uh, and get some fresh air. Um, but especially join me in thanking this really superb panel. Thank you. Thank you.